yeah, I welcome you to our next session of um, abstraction and economy, uh, which will take uh, place today. We do welcome uh, Marina Wischmidt and uh, Markus Wissen uh, for the for our next chapter. Um, as you know, we there were already uh, uh, well, this is the fourth part in our series. Uh, we are inviting um, uh, yeah theorists um, and uh, to talk about uh, special specific aspects of um, our topic, uh, which uh, deals with the question um, how um, processes of abstraction are interacting uh, with economy in a dialectical way. And um, yeah, the uh, symposium abstraction and economy exam examines the tension between abstraction and economy from different perspectives of art and architecture theory, history, as well as law, sociology, philosophy, and economics. Um, abstraction and economy addresses questions about the challenges of um, global economy with its claim to expansive growth in relation to aesthetics, technology, and democracy. Um, what we do is um, we're asking about the role of art between concrete uh, abstraction and um, as a be between concretion and abstraction. And uh, we do discuss formalistic approaches to art theory with its assertion to autonomy, as well as the social and econo economic aspects that critical theory takes into account in order to track down the aesthetic regime of capitalism. That's what, it's a short um, uh, text on what we are um, discussing here. Um, as I said, it's uh, the fourth um, part of a series, uh, Patricia, Patricia Krojonka. She started uh, with a lecture on the uh, building of Postsparkasse here in the, in the heart of Vienna. And uh, she was talking about the aesthetic regime of this um, bank and uh, its connections to um, um, yeah, to dealing with abstraction in a new, uh, in, a, in a new way in architecture, uh, which were very much connected also to the beginning um, of aesthetic problems um, in the in the avant-garde. Uh, we had a second part of uh, we, we we were talking with Nikita Davan and Christian Scherer, um, and the third uh, part uh, we invited Brenna Bender um, and Sven Lüttiken. Uh, Brenna Bender uh, is, um, as a, was uh, speaking as a lawyer and Sven Lüttgen, an art historian, uh, were talking about also uh, questions of um, abstractions um, uh, concerning the, the property uh, and um, the question of property and abstractions to, uh, to bring it together. Yeah, today, um, Marina Wischmidt uh, will um, uh, give us a short statement. Marina Wischmidt teaches at the Goldsmiths College, uh, University, University of London at College. At the moment, she is um, the Rudolf Arnheim Visiting Professor in Art History at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Currently, she is um, editing a reader on speculation for the documents of contemporary art series. Um, yeah. Some of her important books are Reproducing Autonomy, uh, which uh, she published with, together with Kerstin Stackemeyer in 2016, or uh, Speculation as a Mode of Production, Forms of Value, Subjectivity in Art and Capital. Um, yeah, um, I, maybe I also introduce um, Markus Wissen uh, to you, and then we can uh, start with the statements. Markus Wissen is professor of uh, social sciences with a focus on social, socio-ecological transformation processes at the Berlin School of Economics and Law and fellow at the Institute of, um, uh, for Social Anal Analysis of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. As a political scientist, uh, he teaches and researches social relationships with nature, the imperial way of life, and the social ecological transformation of automobility. 
Uh, some of his uh, publications include the book, The Imperial Mode of Living, Everyday Life and the Ecological Crisis of Capitalism, uh, which was published in 2021, together with Ulrich Brandt. Um, yeah, uh, so um, as you can see, and with my background, um, you can see here the poster of Falke Pisano, who is also here tonight. Uh, thank you, Falke. Um, so, um, yeah, when you following our series, you can see that uh, for each uh, uh, lecture, we do have a new poster. So uh, this uh, poster series develops and uh, changes and transforms. Um, and this is um, one aspect uh, we do think is very important um, by thinking about this, um, uh, this, this topic we brought up, um, the economy um, a question in, in relation to the to the arts and uh, the steps of production which are connected to it. Um, so what we do have today is natural and capital. It's, um, you put a focus on that. Falke, may I maybe first uh, ask you uh, to say something on this poster uh, series before we start then? Uh, I thank you. Yeah, yes, I didn't. Um, yeah, so um, basically, uh, Jenny asked me to do the poster, and I was very happy to be in touch with her again. I wanted, and also, um, Marina's work, for instance, has also been very uh, important for me last years. Um, but I also did not want to overwork myself. So I made a kind of division of hours, how much hours I could work for the budget, and set up a system in which I could trace. Uh, the work that I was doing and also share a bit of my um, conditions of work while I was doing it. Um, and at the same time, not uh, uh, there was the <clears throat> agreement I made with myself that the post should be finished when it was finished uh, and not have this idea that the things can always be much better if I put more of my own hours in it. So that is actually the very simple um, production model of the posters, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Falke. Yeah, may I ask, um, yeah, who would like to start? Um, Marina, would you like to start with your uh, statement so that then we can go further? Sure. Um, I just wanted to check what sort of times we were thinking for each one, because I don't know if mine is so short. Yeah, we have um, about um, 10, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll see how much I can I can get in and then the rest will come in the discussion. So as um, as the abstract indicated, can you all hear a train or is it just bothering me? Can you hear the train? It's no? fine for us. Thank you. OK, good. It's good. There's going to be a lot of it. Uh, so this lecture will depart uh, from some of my previous work around art and exception in order to survey some of the consequences of thinking in terms of the significance of exceptions and externalities to both political ecology and the economic paradigms that have emerged to value nature. So I'd like to start by considering the, the perhaps in some senses counterintuitive suggestion although it's one with clear ecological implications, that externality is intrinsic to the capitalist mode of production in general and to a phase of it dominated by extraction in particular. However, while we're aware of the process of value being converted into waste as one that is constantly being condensed in time, political ecology shows us that the construction and devaluation of nature from non-human life to gendered and racialized labor is a precondition of commodification, which has been analyzed in terms such as permanent primary or primitive accumulation, uh, accumulation by dispossession, or the ecological surplus that Jason Moore talks about, concept that is in constellation with the one of surplus population that Marx identified as corollary with the capitalist mode of production as it is necessary to the reproduction of capital as a class relation 
and which has lately been brought into focus again in projects looking at racialization and incarceration as the dynamics facilitating the becoming surplus of populations, as well as urban accumulation and resource frontiers, so also the surplusing of space. Expulsions, displacement, gentrification, the multiplication of sacrifice zones, as they're called in the US and elsewhere. So this kind of emphasis on externality being internal to the value cycle recalls Marx's observation that the expulsion of labor <clears throat> and thus the creation of a surplus population goes hand in hand with its absorption of labor that produces surplus value. It thus entails a reflection on the relationship between extraction and exploitation and whether extraction marks a new configuration of absolute surplus value. Likewise, an understanding of how race and racialization figure into capitalist social relations can depart from an analysis defined around the three X's as recently proposed by Chris Chen and Sarika Chandra, expulsion, exploitation, and expropriation, or as they write, quote, how capitalism produces relational interlinkages among different domains of social life through a general measure of capitalist value. End quote. A triple lens, which also precludes the need for identifying a primary determination in, for example, race or class or any other social location or identity, while positing the material ground for solidarity. So it's kind of an intersectional revision of a, a, a critique of totality. At the same time, while keeping in mind the structural role of the expulsion, expropriation, and exploitation of differentiated and stratified human labor power and non-human natures, and here we'd also have to talk about how this triple lens can be applied, for example, to the category of the human itself. So keeping in mind the structural role of the three X's um, to capitologically, as well as in terms of its reproduction as a capitalist accumulation. There's another basic principle here that again Moore, Jason Moore reminds us of, the externality to value is key for the reproduction of value, that appropriation of so-called free resources is not only necessary to the production of value that happens through commodification, it may actually be more productive of value in some cases than the exchange of commodities. As Liam Kampling and Alejandro Polas review this point in their recent book, Capitalism in the Sea, quote, appropriation in new commodity frontiers is greater than in existing zones of commodification, allowing for the competitive increase in relative surplus value through productivity gains, end quote. While this need for an externality to value in order for there to be value, manifests in their discussion in the extraction of aquatic life forms with value on global markets, it is clear that non-valued or devalued labor and resources, from domestic labor to attention spans and previously exchanged commodities, um, as in uh, gig economies, such as Airbnb, are also the frontiers of extraction as the direct appropriation, that is unmonetized and unvalued, except perhaps as data that happens in social reproduction and platform economies. Which is to say, if the appropriation of free stuff, stuff that it doesn't pay for, and valorizes further in the cycle of production or expels as waste, is key to the accumulation of capital per se, and that this has been recognized from Marx to Luxembourg, to Rosa Luxembourg, in her theory of imperialism, for example, which is this process on a geopolitical scale. It can be suggested that capital in an era characterized by extraction rather than production becomes dependent on this dynamic of devaluation and commodity frontiers as never before. In other words, we can see how the locus of critical analysis can move from the disposability of human labor as it has been so radically underlined by the effects of the pandemic to the fabric of nature that shows us how the transition from value to waste or the direct conversion to waste is unfolding on an unprecedented scale from mining to AI 
while labor as an economic or political actor is steadily eclipsed, turning what Michael Denning called wageless life into an endlessly mutable field of accumulation and extraction, from criminalization and abandonment to the already cited extension of commodity form into further and further zones of human activity, as Nikhil Pal Singh suggests, in ways that are determined by the logic of racialization. As the economic geographer Arthur Scarrick puts it in his work on neoliberalism as neo-feudalism and neo-colonialism, on the other hand, extractive logics reproduce class relations more successfully than they produce profit, which our low growth standard economies in the West would seem to confirm, quote, with the neoliberal turn away from exploitation, the question centers on controlling the population superfluous to the functioning of the system. And the central part of this question focuses on how to extract rents from this population to support the overall, what he calls, aristocratic order. All this suggests that it's important to break down in arguments about externalities to value, at what point the external becomes not just the internal, but the core of a particular historical and systemic tendency in the capital relation. The background question to this, already quite substantial question then, has to be how we understand economic rationality or irrationality in capitalism, which is related to, but not identical with, the question of what drives divisions between the economic and the political, or in more reductionist terms, between the economic and the cultural, in many formulations of anti-capitalist critique. So skipping over a bunch of stuff, um, because there's not really time right now. So having established now, uh, perhaps in maybe more condensed form than I intended, the context for this inquiry um, as it has manifested, I perhaps skipped over that in the main current of my research into art and the externalities of value. I would now like to pick up on what I mentioned at the beginning um, rather in my abstract for this uh, event about climate investment models and social reproduction feminist theory insofar as they lead us to think about the broad paradigm of valuing the invisible or the socially naturalized or in fact the externalized on the one hand from an affirmative and instrumental and on the other from a criti critical and strategic perspective and then we can see what the correspondences and distinctions between these two uh, spaces are. The connection that I would make between the analyses I've undertaken of the registration or the occlusion of labor in art and the discussion to follow is the proposition that the recognition of labor, where before there was only so-called nature or free activity, is the first step of inscribing an activity, a subjectivity or a space into value relations and thus making it possible to analyze them through a lens of systemic reproduction and totality, as well as differentiated composition and the perpetuation of inequality. However, there is a problematic link between this critical recognition and the strategic affirmation of such elements externalized by the capitalist value form or capitalist markets, however you want to set your lens. This is a link that needs to be comprehended in full, meaning also in all its dialectical and structural necessity in order to avoid the generation of solutions to capital's valorization crisis from the left, while recognizing, as Ed Graham writes in his review of Kate Soper's latest book, quote, the economic necessity behind environmentally damaging consumption patterns, end quote. And that focus on populations as consumers should be filled out with a focus on the valorization of value at the level of global capital and the capital labor relation, as well as the externalization by gender, race, and species that creates profitable pools of low value and decommodified labor and life in the cycle of devalorization that capital is currently trapped in, or rather trapping us in. There are different ways, theoretically, coming, coming from this, to approach the problematic of recognition and how it gets connected to prospects of emancipatory change. There's an extensive discourse, for example, in contemporary post-Frankfurt School critical theory that centers recognition and the counter discourse, 
that claims this move abandons the critical materialist framework and critical theory in favor of an ethical and idealist approach whose presupposition is equality and homogeneity rather than a constantly pluralizing and polarizing society of ever more intensified forms of exploitation, oppression, all intensified, of course, globally, as well as locally by climate breakdown. There is an analogous discourse that targets the discourse of human rights and laterally perhaps the rights of nature insofar as rights are positioned as given, primary and rationally administered rather than the conditional territory gained in asymmetrical struggle between say governments and corporations and groups of people around specific structural and contingent instances of inequality or violence. Both of these are informed, both of these uh, critiques are informed by resistance to the naturalization or ontologization. And there's also of course an anthropological register in which claims about uh, recognition are made as well. The naturalization or ontologization of political configurations, which are rather to be seen as social and historical and as such can be considered political in the first place. The critical framework of these objections to questions of recognition and rights as positive departure points can be historical materialist, post-structuralist, feminist, critical race theoretical, as well as paradigms linked to queer and indigenous scholarship and epistemologies. I would add another lens to these, one which partakes in the repudiation of claims that are ontologically rather than historically grounded, but which comes from a specific trajectory that I'm most familiar with, and that is Marxist value theory and the critiques of race and gender, as well as nature that emerge from that trajectory. An example would be critiques of social reproduction theory that suggest its focus on gendered labor can take on dimensions of naturalizing of that labor and gender. One example would be the Logic of Gender essay by Maya Gonzalez and Jean Nathan, the work of Amy Diaz on the loss of focus in this theory on capitalist abstraction. Some of the writing I've been doing with Zoe Sutherland or what I would focus on here, Beverly Best's recent piece, Wages for Housework Redux, Social Reproduction and the Utopian Dialectic of the Value Form. The point I would like to take from this essay is her emphasis that social reproduction doesn't count for the value metric that ensures the reproduction of capital because it is, in other terms, an externality. And that is precisely why capitalism is a life annihilating mode of production. What does not count for it, it is happy to see destroyed. As she writes, quote, the unwaged activities of social reproduction, potentially the very definition of wealth in an associated mode of production cannot be objectified or therefore quantified as wealth in capitalist terms. Neither can photosynthesis, mineralization, the water cycle, or the mating of polar bears. None of these activities process or processes count for capital because none can be quantified by capital. Value is an accounting category. Capital is a system of domination by math. It is not that social reproductive activity doesn't count as significant in Marx's analysis. It is that quite literally unwaged social reproductive activity doesn't count for capital. A careful accounting of value generation is a matter of grasping how and why a capitalist mode of production is anathema to human and planetary well-being, end quote. Sorry for the long quote, but um, I think it brings a lot together. What it clarifies is that the problem is not a faulty mode of accounting or the necessity of an emancipatory theory that can diagnose blind spots in that mode of accounting with a view to compensating for them. For example, in feminist economics that looks at household economies in particular. It is rather to take up the challenge of the dialectic between the call for wages for and wages against housework that initiated the social reproduction perspective in Marxist feminism and to get to grips with how valuation works in capital's accounting. That is valuation signifying both value relations and what they structurally exclude and the attempt to capture different aspects of those relations in the metric of value as bound to the commodity form, including the dimension of fetishism which internalizes this metric as the most direct channel to recognition and thus compensation of an activity, a fetishism which is socially necessary and thus to be understood dialectically rather than seen as ideologically diluted or morally compromised. What Best's analysis also clarifies elsewhere in the text, if only implicitly in the passage that I quoted, 
is that this externalization of activities as non-labor, non-economic, is symptomatic of the accelerating crisis tendency of capital, as um, mentioned earlier. The more it expels as waste or irrelevance and the less value it produces from what it can subsume, the less value there is for it and the more extraction, which you can say is, can be um, seen as the desperate part of the cycle of valorization, comes to predominate, undercutting the sustainability of an already principally unsustainable mode of production and canceling another X, which would be expansion rather than extraction, expanded production of value. Um, so I don't think I really have any more time. Um, I'll just quickly say a few things about that relate uh, specifically to natural. Take your capital. time, Marina. Uh, oh, just, okay. uh, take your time. Uh, I was okay, little, I don't have. I don't I, have. My measurement was a little bit short before. Sorry for that. That's okay. Um, so then, uh, yeah, I'm actually nearly finished anyway. So I just have a, a quote to conclude this part of the discussion again from the. Beverly Best text, quote, that exploitation is capital's only means of growth is ultimately its fatal dysfunction. Characterized by Marx as capital's crisis tendency, it is an internal contradiction unfurling slow motion, car crash style, particularly as it mediates various contemporary forms of oppression and group differentiated vulnerability, end quote. So moving on from this question about what results are yielded in recognizing externalities of value as internal to value and capital critical paradigms, as well as other critical paradigms that diagnose the centrality of racialized, gendered, and illegalized labor to capitalist accumulation and capitalist social reproduction, I'd like us to see how that question might be recontextualized in the forms of capitalist accounting that, speaking at the most general level, try to price various aspects of the environment as ecosystem services, or indeed natural capital, in the ostensible attempt to promote robust ecological improvement outcomes by making them market imminent rather than externalized to the market or externalized by the market. The most obvious example of this we have witnessed over the past decade, apart from the general vocabulary I just mentioned, of ecosystem services or natural capital uh, is carbon trading and carbon budgets, you could say, where you have a dynamic of displacement of or compensation for pollution between richer and poorer nations and carbon budgets, which can be defined as, quote, the total amount of carbon dioxide emissions that human activities can be allowed to generate in order to avoid excessive global warming, end quote. So this is a measure which can be adopted at a national or a global scale and other more local scales too, of course, and is profoundly indeterminate because its guideline depends both on the sensitivity of the metrics adopted in it and the range of climate sensitivity to carbon emissions that these metrics aim to capture where timelines of local variations induce uncertainty. It is an example of a technocratic or solutionist approach to ecological problem solving, which however in common with the critical approaches to unrecognized or externalized labor, suggests that if the market can recognize something as a commodity, it can value it. And if it can value it, then it will take steps to sustain it as a source of value. Anti-capitalist critics of such notions, however, claim instead that it is a matter of decommodifying carbon which may include tactics such as disinvestment and other means of destroying the value proposition of polluting uh, resources, but also requires a shift to non-capitalist modes of social production and reproduction. On this point, Peter Somerville, whose definition of carbon budgets I just quoted, who's a UK-based climate change policy analyst, notes in his recent essay, Revisiting Connections Between Capital and Nature, Part Two, The Case of Climate Change, that not only must current polluting energy resources be sidelined, but the green growth capitalism that is responsible for land grabs, expulsions, and further forms of the degradation of the natural and social world and the drive for an ecological transition is also not tenable. So he writes, quote, this categorical decommodification of fossil fuels contradicts the tendency of ecological economists and others to treat nature as if it holds or should hold capitalist value. 
However, some kinds of anti-fossil capital actions, such as on disinvestment, divestment, sorry, may not be sufficient to achieve such decommodification. They could just mean reducing the amount of fossil fuels being produced and may also be compatible with a shift to green capitalism based on renewables. There is a risk that commodified fossil fuels will simply be replaced by commodified renewable energy so that capitalism continues more or less as before, end quote. And this is a problem that he suggests few programmatic formulations of the Green New Deal uh, have adequately taken into account. So perhaps the problem here, as with uh, my very quick uh, skim over social reproduction feminist theory and the problem of recognition of value, is that it is necessary as an initial base of the reconfig basis, sorry, as an initial basis of the reconfiguration of a mode of production by means of making political claims on the basis of some of the structurally necessary elements that it wishes to avoid supporting or accounting for. Taking to its terminal point, this is an argument that, would, that such accounting, such recognition would overwhelm capitalist rationality by making it pay and account for everything. However, we see that this is insufficient as an emancipatory critique or a program for social transformation away from crisis capitalism in the example of carbon accounting, which artificially sustains markets in and delays transitions away from fossil fuels, and secondarily preserves the infrastructures of market valuation into a post-transition centering of renewables, with the extraction, expropriation, and exploitation to return to their earlier excess that this will perpetuate. A substitution where many things stay the same, as per Leo Cardi. Um, so that's actually it for uh, what I had to say, though I cut out a big chunk in the middle, but that's fine. We can come back to it um, in the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marina. I think uh, you brought up a lot of questions. Um, I would like to ask uh, Markus Wissen to give his statement so that we can uh, come back to the discussion of these two statements afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation and also for, for your very inspiring talk, Marina. I think there are a lot of commonalities with which, with what I am going to present now. My starting point is a different one. I would like to look at the abstractions from nature, the ecological abstractions that are inherent in dominant representations of the ecological crisis, representations like planetary boundaries or the Anthropocene narrative. This is my starting point. So what I'm going to do is to first look at the ecological crisis in the so-called earth system sciences, then to look at the ecological crisis from the point of view of critical theory, and third, to make some final remarks on what I call infrastructure socialism, which I consider a political perspective for an emancipatory left. So to come to the first point, um, the ecological crisis and the earth system sciences. This is a quite famous abstraction, a quite, a quite famous representation of the ecological crisis that has been produced by Johann Rockström and others more than 10 years ago. It's called planetary boundaries. And what we see here are certain so-called earth system processes that threaten to cross certain, certain threats that is leaving a safe operating space, leaving a space in which the consequences of these processes still are manageable for humans. It's very important. And, it's a representation of the ecological crisis that has served to shake yeah, discourses, to shake politicians, to point to the urgency of counteracting the ecological crisis, because as one can see, certain thresholds already have been crossed, like for example, in the case of biodiversity loss or climate change or the nitrogen cycle that are um, about to get out of control. So we know that the ecological crisis is a very severe phenomenon, that it is, let's say, a 
a composition of certain phenomena of or phenomena of earth systematic processes that together constitute the ecological crisis. Another important representation or talk about the ecological crisis is the Anthropocene narrative. Anthropocene, you will be familiar with this term, I think, is a narrative that implies that the human imprint on the global environment is now so large that the earth has entered a new geological epoch. The term was coined by Prutzen and Strömer in the year 2000. There is a paper in Nature, in the, period, in, in the journal Nature from 2002 by Paul Krusen, where he shortly describes what is meant by the Anthropocene. So a new geological epoch, an epoch that is shaped by the human imprints in geology, in biology, the human imprints on nature. Humans have altered nature in a way that it cannot be it's considered natural anymore. So we live in a new geological epoch that has succeeded the Holocene and can be called the Anthropocene, the epoch that is shaped by the human influence on nature. We can see that in various phenomena, for example, climate change, land transformations, and biodiversity loss through forestry and agriculture, the damming of rivers, the transformation of landscapes through mining activities, but also, for example, the consequences of nuclear fallout after nuclear tests or nuclear bombing at the end of the Second World War. The spatial imprints of megacities also are important here. It is contested um, if the Anthropocene really is an appropriate term for describing the epoch we are living in. And it is contested when to date the beginning of the Anthropocene. One could, if one would have a very wide understanding of this term, date the beginning at um, the Neolithic Revolution. That means a time when people, when humans started to systematically colonize nature in order to appropriate it to their needs. One could also take the beginning of the Industrial Revolution as a starting point, because here a new metabolism between society and nature began, a metabolism that was not based on using solar energy any longer, or not mainly based on using solar energy, but on using fossil energy, first coal and later on oil, oil, gas, all the fossil energies that we still need today. But it seems to be that there is a consensus emerging to date the beginning of the Anthropocene in the mid of the 20th century. And the reason for this is shown in this graph that is taken from a paper by Will Steffen and others. It is called the Great Acceleration. And what you can see here are various indicators that have increased, that have accelerated from the mid of the 20th century onwards. Indicators regarding population, economic activity, resource use, and so on. So because there is a great acceleration of these developments from the mid of the 19th century, of the 20th century onwards, it seems to emerge a concept the Anthropocene, or the starting part of the Anthropocene is the mid of the 20th century. So this would be another famous representation of the ecological crisis. There are certain questions, crucial questions that one has to ask in this context. What are the causes for these developments? And who is affected by it? So the causation and the vulnerability issue is very important. Vulnerability consisting of exposure to a certain environmental threat, sensitivity and adaptive capacity. So who is responsible for these trends that we have seen for crossing these thresholds, crossing the planetary boundaries and initiating a new geological about the Anthropocene. And who is affected by the ecological crisis that is caused by these developments? Here, the Anthropocene and the um, planetary boundaries narrative remain more or less silent, or at least they may remain on a very abstract level. The Anthropocene, as said, is considered a human-dominated geological epoch. 
Humanity itself has become a global geophysical force. So it's humankind, it's the big we, it's our humans, and it's not further differentiated. Whose um, activities are responsible and who particularly is affected by the ecological crisis? Yeah. More recently, um, the people working on these issues, the earth system sciences, have um, stressed that their diagnosis also has distributional dimensions, so that the ecological crisis is not simply something that is caused by all of us and affects all of us, but, but that the causation as well as the effects are unevenly distributed. There has been an attempt to save not just a safe, to, to, to define not just a safe operating space, but also a safe and just operating space, a safe and just corridor, corridor for people and the planet. However, this is not further specified. The social relations which mediate the uneven distribution of causation and vulnerability are not analyzed. We just talked about poor people, being affected by climate change is talked about the economy or economic activities that are at the heart, at the root cause of climate change and the ecological crisis, but the exact drivers, the social relations, the social relations of class, gender, race, colonialism are not analyzed. The consequence are certain paradoxes. If you want so, the Anthropocene discourse and the Anthropocene and the planetary boundaries narrative denaturalizes nature. Nature is not natural anymore. It is shaped by humans. This is what this discourse acknowledges. However, at the same time, as it denaturalizes nature, it naturalizes the social relations in which this has been happening. So there are no social relations analyzed as responsible or as mediating the effects of the ecological crisis. But the fact that we are about to cross or have already crossed certain planetary boundaries and have started a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, is situated, or the causes of this fact are situated in human nature. They are situated in certain inherent properties of human nature. In, for example, the unlimited, or let's say the assumption that there are unlimited needs and that there is a pursuit of maximizing utility that is inherent in human nature. This is a problem and this is a paradox, denaturalization of nature and at the same time, naturalizing the social relations under which the human impact of nature has developed in a way that it is now indeed a threat for humankind. A second paradox is that there is a closure of political space. If the relations between humans and nature are not social, but determined by natural properties of the human species, like for example, the supposedly unlimited needs or the pursuit of and maximizing profit, maximizing utility that is located in human nature. If this is the case, then there is no longer any space for the political in a strong sense. All we can do is creating institutional incentives for saving natural capital and redirecting the technological development into a direction that does not harm nature any longer. And this is indeed what is proposed suggested in this discourse. So we have to think about technologies that help us to engineer the climate, geoengineering technologies, like for example, um, influencing solar radiation or removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to be able to cope with climate change. So if you want so, there is a certain post-political ontology inherent in the Anthropocene and planetary boundaries narrative this leads to a, and now I quote from a paper by, paper by, by uh, Eva Löfbrand and others, this leads to a paradoxical relationship between environmental apocalyptic thought, 
on the one hand and institutional status quo on the other. Yeah. So we have a very apolitical, ap ap apocalyptic representation of the ecological crisis, like that one in the planetary boundaries um, a narrative. But at the same time, the, the people who create this representation hardly think about the social relations and are therefore not capable of thinking beyond the existing social relations and institutional configurations, the same configurations which have brought to the fore the environmental crisis. This leads me to a second point, to my second point, that is the ecological crisis and critical theory. So what would be different from the perspective of critical theory? Marina has already talked about the important tendencies and structural mechanisms of capitalism. So I'm very much in line with her analysis. Capitalism is a mode of production that is based on the commodification of labor power, and that is not driven by the satisfaction of needs, but by the maximization of profits. It is driven not by an exchange I mean, it's driven not by a use value orientation, but by an exchange value orientation. If you want, so this is implicitly considered human in the Anthropocene and the planetary boundaries narrative. Yeah. This is something that is located in human nature. Humans are by nature profit maximizing, utility maximizing beings. But actually, this is not the case. Capitalism. Is and this kind of organizing the economy in a way that maximizing the profit is the main is the main aim of the economy. This is a quite recent phenomenon of let's say 200, 300 years of age, and it is a non-necessary historical outcome of social struggles. It has very important social ecological implications. Capitalism systematically tends to undermine, to devalue that on which it depends. That is nature, and Marina has already mentioned that, nature is taken for granted. The reproduction of labor power is taken for granted. It has no value. This has no value in capitalism, you know, but it is the base of value creation, and as such, it is taken for granted. And it is threatened to be systematically undermined. Yeah. Nancy Fraser has um, theorized on this, and she um, has theorized as the, let's say, the contradiction of social reproduction as the basic contradiction of capitalism. Social reproduction um, as something that is um, the base for capitalist activities, but that is nevertheless devalued and separated from capitalism. Consider the um, work in households that is done mainly done by women. It is not value creating in a capitalist sense. So it is devalued, it is separated from the formal economy and it is taken for granted. It is disavowed, it is devalued, but nevertheless, it is an essential precondition for the formal economy. Without this work, without this labor done in households, mainly unpaid work by women, there would not be a reproduction of the labor force and therefore there would not be a capitalist exploit, exploitation in, and no profit production in the formal economy. The same applies to nature. Nature is something that is taken for granted. Yeah? It's taken for granted and the, it has no value in the capitalist sense. And therefore it is um, overexploited, it's always tends to be systematically undermined. Marx has mentioned that in Capital when he talks about the tendency of the capitalist mode of production to always to systematically undermine the sources of wealth. That is, as Marx said, the earth and the worker. The question is how can capitalism work if it perpetually strives to undermine its own preconditions? It can work and and here I also refer to Marxian theories like, for example, Rosa Luxemburg, who was already mentioned by Marina. This can work as long as there is the possibility to 
the possibility to externalize social ecological consequences in space and time. So as long as this is possible, as long as there is uneven development, as long as there are not only highly industrialized countries, but also non-capitalist spaces or um, less developed capitalist economies on earth, it is possible for the early industrialized, for the highly developed industrialized countries to externalize their social ecological cause to other areas. This is something that um, has brought to the fore climate change, or that was, a, or that can be seen in the, um, in the in emissions of, of CO2. Yeah? So um, climate change, or let's say emit, em, um, in emitting CO2 is a kind of externalizing social ecological cause to other regions on earth, that is to regions where the big rainforests, for example, are that absorb the CO2 or to the future. Yeah? to shift it, to shift the effects to future generations. The atmosphere, the, the CO2, as we know, concentrates in the atmosphere and contributes to global warming. And we know that today already many people, particularly in the global south, are affected by global warming, but future generations will be affected even more by that. Yeah. So climate change, but also resource conflicts, the crisis of social production now are uh, symptoms that the possibilities of shifting, of externalizing the social ecological consequences of the capitalist mode of production are exhausted. We cannot go on with that without aggravating the ecological crisis in a way that it threatens to undermine the very conditions of further capitalist production. This is what we are experiencing right now, what we see in climate change, what we see in the hard conflicts in the international climate negotiations, what we see in the resource conflicts between different capitalist states and economies. Yeah. So the possibility of externalizing is increasingly exhausted. And that is the reason for the current aggravation of, and of the environmental crisis. And also one of the reasons for the rising geopolitical tensions that one can observe at the moment. Yeah. So we are amid the crisis that has its, its roots in the capitalist economy and that is yeah, aggravated at the moment because the very mechanism of processing the crisis tendencies of capitalism, that is the possibility of externalizing social ecological costs, does not function, does not work anymore. We are, it has got to the limits. Yeah. This is the let's say social mechanism, these are the social, social structures, the social relations behind what has been analyzed as crossing planetary boundaries, as the beginning of the Anthropocene. And, it is diff and it's very important to take this into account because it leads us to a complete, complete different um, conclusion regarding what we can do in order to cope with the crisis. It's not simply technology. Technology will not help us. Marina also already pointed to the fact that it is difficult to simply develop green technologies in order to cope with the environmental crisis that will not suffice because even if we have them, we have them, yeah, it's good to have renewable energies. It also might be good to have electric cars in a limited amount, yeah. but thinking about or implementing, relying on these new green technologies under the conditions of economic growth will counteract the ecological effects of these technologies because we also need resources for green and uh, renewable energy infrastructures. We need resources in order to construct electric cars, to drive electric cars. You know, this is not um, ecologically neutral. It needs resources. And the more infrastructures, the, no, the more um, electric cars we have, the more resources we need in order to drive them. This is a problem, and so we cannot solve the problems of the environmental crisis. We cannot cope with this crisis phenomena that have been identified by the earth system scientists simply by technologies or by, by a few, or let's say, by institutional incentives to change human behavior. We have to think about the very mechanisms of social reproduction, of the way how we organize labor and the economy. And this is my last point, some short remarks on the direction in which we could think that is infrastructure socialism as a political perspective. The basic idea here is that we have to break with the 
self-destructive and increasingly self-destructive logic of capitalism. We have to do so in a radical and at the same time concrete manner. So we cannot fight capitalism on an abstract level. This is not possible. How could we do that? Let's go out to the streets and demand the um, abolishment of capitalism that does not interest anybody and we will not gain power through such actions. So the critique of capitalism has to be radical, but at the same time, it has to be concrete. It has to be a critique in the form of a real utopia, as Eric Ollenwright has called that. The strategic orientation would be imagining and shaping the economy from the perspective of social reproduction. This is radical and concrete. It is radical because it questions the capitalist logic of competition and profit maximization, it replaces this logic, lo logic by a logic of care. The foundational economy, as it has been called, the foundational economy that has been invisibilized and taken for granted as a precondition for capitalist production now becomes visible as the principal source of our wealth. The foundational economy are the infrastructure systems on which we all depend. Healthcare, social housing, and food, water provision, electricity provision, and um, all these infrastructures that help us, that are necessary to reproduce us, to reproduce our daily lives. This is considered as a simple precondition of the formal economy in capitalism, but actually it is the source of our wealth. And we have to imagine and rethink our economy from this perspective, from the perspective of a logic of care and infrastructure pro provision. We have to think in the dire direction of a foundational economy. Compared to this foundational economy, large parts or even the most part of the capitalist economy are revealed as dispensable or even destructive. That what creates the so-called wealth in our societies is destructive and is dependable. A large part of this wealth, we do not need it. Yeah? Nobody needs SUVs. Nobody needs a new smartphone every year. Nobody must continuously change his or her garderobe. This is not necessary for a good life. That people nevertheless have the impression that all this is necessary is due to a mode of production that can only reproduce itself in the form of a constant revolution and transformation of the productive forces that depends on creating ever new, often useless and even destructive needs as soon as it has developed the means for satisfying these needs. The foundational economy of care and infrastructure provision thus puts the economy back on its feet and forces us or makes us, doesn't force us, it helps us to indeed concentrate on what is really necessary, what really supports a good life. So it's radical to focus on this um, orientation. It is also concrete because we all make experience every day that we rely on the help of others, the care of others, that we rely on certain infrastructure systems without which we could not live. We have a long-standing experience in publicly or even democratically driving these infrastructure systems. So in many municipalities, in many places of the world, water provision, healthcare are driven publicly. They have been neoliberalized in recent times, but nevertheless, there's still an experience of driving them publicly and driving them much more successfully in a public way than private, enterprises that drive them in order to make profit can really operate them. So um, maybe my last slide, why socialism? You know, I call this infrastructure of socialism. It's not my invention, this word. It's a term that is discussed in the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Why socialism? Here I refer to the so-called eco-socialist manifest by Joe Covell and Michael Löwy. And, who have defined eco-socialism according to four criteria. The first one being ecological rationality. So reflexive society nature relations, society nature relations that are sensitive for the reproductive necessities 
of human bodies and of nature. Democratic control, this refers to how to um, yeah, understand property, um, that there is a necessity to put economic property to, product, to put the productive forces under democratic control. Social equality, equality um, as far as the access to basic infrastructures is concerned, but also as far as the um, opportunity to participate in decision-making processes is concerned. Everybody should have the possibility to equally participate in decision-making as far as he or she is affected by the outcome of these decision-making processes. And the last criterion, the predominance of the use value over the exchange value, that is the predominance of another logic than the capitalist one. And this requires indeed a decommodification, a reversal of this trend, of this tendency, which will with which we have con been confronted in the neoliberal phase of capitalism in particular, that is the decommodification of nature and ever of ever more spheres of daily life, but not only to come to overcome neoliberal liberalism, but to also overcome capitalism as a destructive mode of production. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much for your very, yeah, um, very interesting and rich uh, presentations, uh, both of you. Thank you so much.